All right, so this is the third video for chapter two. And so we have covered Pavlov and uh, the salivating dogs. We've covered Watson and little Albert, and uh, we've also covered Guthrie talking about how our motions, the motions of our body are actually stimuli that um, uh, kind of inform our ne next behavior. Now, you're probably hearing all this and wondering, what does this possibly have to do with uh, people's lives? How do I take this to um, this information and, and use it to, to better and help positively transform people's lives? Again, that was the starting point for this class. And he, in this section, I hope to come back to that. Now, um, the, the thing I hope is that actually you take a minute, um, I believe it's about uh, 13 or 14 minutes, uh, and watch the snake phobia video. Uh, there's a link here, and it's, it's just a great video because it's of the, uh, a leading researcher on classical conditioning and uh, clinical work, so a leading researcher on, on phobias, who has taken what we know about classical conditioning and applied it to uh, working with phobias. And in the video, you see a young woman who has an intense phobia of snakes. And yet she, um, for the purpose of, of a demonstration, she uh, challenges herself to work through that fear on camera. And so uh, they, they, in the video, they show um, them bringing out a snake. And uh, you see the process of her through the several hour intervention, uh, moving from just a, an intense panic filled reaction to having a fairly calm demeanor with the snake. It's just remarkable to, to see. So um, first off, I just wanna theoretically break that down. So snakes, I don't know how you feel about snakes, but um, snakes are actually a neutral stimulus. Right? A lot of people think, oh, it's just inherent, innate in me that I uh, am afraid of snakes. No, you know, infants don't tend to have that fear of snakes. Um, and so we, we think of it as a, as a neutral stimulus. Um, the, yet snake phobias are pretty common. People get really intensely afraid of snakes. And um, so the question is why? Well, it's interesting to think about um, when you have um, experiences with snakes. Now, not everyone actually interacts with the snake, but generally people see snakes in movies, snakes in um, different uh, uh, you know, TV shows, um, or they hear people talk about snakes. And in those contexts, there's often a um, intense, uh, sort of an indicator that um, we should be afraid of snakes. So if it's a scary movie with snakes in it, you got the intense music, gets your heartbeat racing. Uh, if it is, um, you know, if it's just someone talking about snakes, there's this, oh, you need to be afraid of it. And so there's sort of this emotional fear response that, that um, is already brought up in just the way people talk about it or in what we see of it. And the thought is that as we're growing up, some of us are exposed to multiple uh, situations where fear gets paired up with snakes. And gradually, the thought is that we, uh, we become to associate snakes with fear. That it's not, again, that it's not in a but that because it gets paired over and over and over with uh, fear-inducing stimuli, like people screaming when they see a snake, when, um, when uh, movies show snakes attacking people, all of that having this classical conditioning effect where we combine fear with snakes. Um, now, I'm going to come back to this idea um, because, again, part of what classical conditioning offers us is a is a conceptualization of problems. So it's helpful to just be able to, to um, understand like what is it that led to this problem? So classical conditioning offers an explanation. 
Um, but of course, another aspect of classical conditioning is saying, what can we do to help this person? And so how does it drive intervention? I want to come back to that in a minute. But I have a, a slide here of another phobia. Maybe some of you, um, maybe some of you identify with a snake phobia, but uh, perhaps more of you even uh, with this one, a math phobia. This idea of uh, math in invoking some in anxiety in people. So this is from the, the textbook. It's a, it's a little silly, but it, it gets the, the message across. So math is actually a neutral stimulus. Um, if you show a two-year-old a math book, they do not fear it, right? They don't have any, any emotional reaction to it. Um, but what happens through elementary school and junior high and high school is that math gets paired up with certain experiences. Now let's imagine that a math teacher is, um, let's imagine a, a math teacher that has an unfriendly uh, demeanor, unfriendly personality, a grating, annoying voice. Well, if someone's unfriendly with a annoying voice, it's already gonna lead to a, a particular response. It's gonna uh, lead to discomfort, dislike, fear. And so before conditioning has been occurred, um, this is just our natural reaction. We have this reaction. And so one possibility is that math could actually be paired up when you have a math teacher who's unfriendly and annoying. Um, you have the math being paired up with something that elicits discomfort, dislike, fear. And then finally, after conditioning, math can lead to a conditioned response of discomfort, dislike, and fear. So again, uh, it, this just helps us understand, helps us break down what is going on in leading this to be uh, to, to develop. Again, people like this explanation. People like having explanations for why are they feeling or why are they reacting the way that they do. So if you can provide that to them, that's really comforting. Again, we're not yet to the point where we're helping them change, but again, just knowing how something developed can bring a little bit of at least emotional comfort. Now, Watson, um, Watson argued that there's a couple of different ways to apply this, to actually be able to help people. Um, so the classical conditioning can be applied in learning and even in unlearning behaviors. Uh, so one thing that Watson pointed out is you can actually condition a new response. Now, I don't know how powerful this image is, uh, but this idea that math is fun. That is a attempt at counter conditioning. That is a, an attempt to take math, where, which we tend to have a negative emotional response to, and pair it with this um, happy emotion, right? fun leads uh, this idea of fun leads to happy emotions so perhaps if we hear this message enough that math is fun maybe we can actually be counter conditioned to have a new reaction to math again i'm i'm not so sure if that image is is powerful enough to elicit you know a, a true happy response in us but if we if we had something that really um, made it sound fun again if we have celebrities or people that are talking about how fun math is, maybe we can actually have some counter conditioning. Um, and Watson said another possibility is um, we could allow the problematic response to be extinguished. So if we have a response, and, and this goes back to Pavlov, that when you um, have a bell and you bring out the dog food, that dog is continuing to, to learn that the bell is a, is a signal that the food is coming. But if you ring the bell, don't bring the food, the dog will slowly have less and less response to the bell. Uh, it will extinguish the salivation response to the bell. So Watson took that and said, well, how do we extinguish um, other types of responses? Well, we can expose people to situations and not have the feared response actually occur. So um, with little Albert, 
you could bring out the rat and continue bringing out the rat over and over again until the, um, the little Albert could potentially learn, oh, this rat isn't going to scare me. Um, the, the, the rat's not paired up with this loud gong anymore. And so it's, it can eventually learn that the rat is not scary. Now, of course, if that rat were to bite him or something like that, then yeah, the, the um, response will probably continue. But, you know, in most likely, enough experience with the rat will lead to extinction. And, uh, and that has some parallels with what Guthrie argued. Um, but Guthrie called it some different things. He said that there's three techniques for breaking habits. And this is really interesting. So he said that, first of all, there's a fatigue te technique. What you do is you present the stimulus repeatedly um, and you try to elicit the undesired response. But what happens if you repeat it enough times, the organism can actually become so fatigued, it can no longer perform the response. Now, um, perhaps you've heard of the idea of getting, you know, a, a teenager comes across a carton of cigarettes and smokes and gets caught smoking. Um, well, how do you get that teenager to stop smoking? Well, you've probably heard this idea of having them smoke the entire pack. And um, that's exact. That's basically the f fatigue technique. Um, so a single cigarette will generally lower your heart um, heart pressure. You'll get a, a calming sensation with it. And so there's there's some you know positive, pleasant experiences with smoking a single cigarette. But if you smoke an entire pack, if you're not a smoker, most likely what will happen is you will actually have a nauseous reaction. So the, uh, you won't have the opportunity to feel the pleasant euphoria. You'll, you'll become so fatigued by it, you can no longer have that pleasant euphoric uh, response to the cigarette. Um, and, um, and this is also true for things like, um, again, similar to what Watson just said, uh, that if you extinguish a response, you can actually get rid of it. So if you, um, and going back to the video, what, what did they do? They brought the snake out and they kept the snake around. And gradually, um, the woman in the video couldn't be afraid any longer. She got so fatigued, her body was so fatigued that she couldn't be afraid of the snake any longer. And what happened then is that um, the, she learned that this snake instead of being associated with her own bodily reaction of fear, she learned that this snake is being associated with, well, uh, a bit more calm, maybe a little bit of feeling tired. And so uh, her, her bodily reaction changed throughout the, the two hours or, or so that she was with the snake. And as a result, she's pairing up the snake with a different bodily state. So that would be the fatigue technique. Um, Guthrie also pointed out you can have a threshold technique where you present the stimulus, but present it so faintly that it doesn't elicit the undesirable response. So in psychology, we call this systematic desensitization. So if you are trying to overcome a fear of elevators, well, you can present um, things that are associated with elevators and you can go in a graduated fashion, you can see a picture of an elevator. And you could see that picture, which might invoke a pretty uh, minor reaction in you. And you can use relaxation techniques to bring yourself down. And then you could, um, you could potentially um, watch a video of someone in an elevator. And perhaps that, again, invokes some anxiety in you. You could practice a relaxation technique and bring yourself down. Um, you're not fully experiencing the panic of an elevator, um, so you're you're just getting to the threshold, but not experiencing the panic attack that you're uh, that you associate with elevators. And then you can get closer and closer until you can actually be in an elevator and not have a, a panic attack. And finally, Guthrie talked about the incompatible stimuli technique. And that's where you present the stimulus with 
when the response can occur. The, um, the undesirable reaction is prevented because um, there's another response that's taking its place. So if I, kind of similar to the last one, but if I first um, was in a really happy or really relaxed state, it would be incompatible for me to immediately go into a, a panic state. Well, uh, this one doesn't always work because, um, you know, fear can come about when you're in a relaxed state. But, um, but there are some circumstances where you just cannot, um, you cannot have that full panic response. So um, if you are, so Guthrie actually pointed this out and I think this is helpful to show it in a, um, with a, a metaphor of how do you break a horse? So in clinical work, work uh, we're dealing with people that have, you know, real strong reactions and, and you can kind of think of it as a um, unbroken horse where a horse is bucking and you can't do anything to stop it. So Guthrie kind of pointed out that there's three options for breaking a horse. One is a challenging one, but potentially you could fatigue the horse. And basically you, you uh, put the saddle on and jump on the horse and ride that horse until it is completely fatigued. And by that point, the, um, the horse will no longer keep bucking. Again, I, I don't know if that would truly work with an unbroken horse, but you know, theoretically, you can kind of get the idea that if you fatigue the horse, it's gonna stop bucking, and it's probably gonna be okay with uh, having being ridden. Um, a, a little more, more gentle, a little bit more progressive uh, approach would be um, where you can gentle the horse. And this is similar to the threshold approach where you place a progressively holder, a heavier weight uh, placed on its back, starting with the blanket, then the saddle, and then finally the rider on top of the saddle. Again, you're, you're just going just below what the, the horse can take in each case. So you could, again, present people with things that they're afraid of, but just that they, they could still manage. And then you can gradually get more and more uh, with the threshold technique. And finally, the incompatible stimuli, you see there that the horse is already um, tied down, so it can't, it can't truly buck. Uh, so this would theoretically be another way to break a horse. I, again, probably doesn't work all that effectively with, with horses that haven't been broken, but um, you can kind of get the idea. If, if the horse can't buck, then it's probably going to um, just sort of grit and bear it with the person on top of um, getting on top of it. And so, um, so potentially, if you take someone who's already in like a really relaxed state or in a happy state, and the, or if you if you put people who are being watched by a hundred people, and uh, and typically they would, um, uh, let's say run off if confronted with a clown, but because 100 people are watching, they feel like they can't do that. Well, then it's an incompatible stimuli. The, they're tied down, so they can't, you know, because of embarrassment, they cannot do their typical reaction. And so they might um, might not react in that way. They might actually be able to, to tolerate a clown, just as an example. So again, we apply that clinically and we could say for phobias, we could expose the client to their phobia. We know that this is effective. We know that this works. If you continue, and we see it in the video. Uh, in the video, we see her um, just uh, interacting with the snake, you know, gradually going from the, the snake being uh, across the room to being able to touch it. Um, but uh, in the video, you see her uh, never leaving, never going to a different room, just continuing to um, keep herself exposed to the phobia. And, um, and you see the video, she gradually has no fear. And this is remarkable. You can actually treat a phobia within a couple of hours. I mean, just think about all the different types of mental, mental disorders uh, people have. 
We cannot treat depression in a, in a few hours. We cannot treat an eating disorder in a few hours, but we could treat a phobia and all it takes is a few hours and a willing participant. And um, this is not the preferred choice for most people. It's so intense that, that uh, many people aren't, aren't really interested. But some people are so broken by their phobia, they're just so crushed by it, that they're willing to do whatever it takes. And so they're willing to put themselves through a, an experience like that. And uh, it just shows their, their desperation. Um, and again, uh, I've, I've seen a video of a treatment of a balloon phobia, and they showed uh, the, that they brought the balloons in, and a woman who had just an intense fear, screaming at the, the sight even of balloons, especially the touch. By the end of the video, she was able to play with the balloons. She was a little bit uncomfortable, but was, um, yeah, had no major reaction to it. And so flooding is just an exceptionally effective treatment for, for phobias in particular. Now, again, uh, another clinical application, I already mentioned this, um, and it can be done with phobias. It can also be done with um, other types of anxiety, like uh, public speaking. The, um, the client in systematic desensitization, the client will list everything they associate with the phobia, and then they rank it, okay? Again, here's a picture of an elevator. Here's a video of an elevator. Here's me actually seeing a, an elevator. Here's me, you know, getting close to an elevator. Um, here's me imagining being in the elevator. And you can sort of order it in this particular order. And in systematic desensitization, you train the client in a relaxation technique. So uh, one is progressive muscle relaxation, where you go throughout your entire body, you tense your muscles, and then you relax them. And once you've been trained in this, you can uh, gradually expose the client to stimuli, and their anxiety never actually becomes intense. And that's really the difference between this and flooding. Um, it gradually moves towards closer approximations that approximations of the phobic object but the the fear the phobic response is never intense so those are real applications of uh, classical conditioning and we um, so we've learned much and been able to help people with these techniques now I, I what I found really interesting about cl classical conditioning is it also applies to addiction but before I apply it to addiction, I have to cover another concept that we haven't touched on yet. Um, I, I might have briefly mentioned it, but uh, uh, the condition compensatory response. So there was a, a study done um, that found, uh, well, let me explain what it is. A condition compensatory response is a condition response that is the opposite of the unconditioned response. Right? With Pavlov's dogs, we have um, salivation in response to the food, and then we train the, the dog to sal salivate in response to the bell. So that's not, that is not opposite, that is very similar. Many times uh, classical conditioning is very similar behaviors, right? There's a, uh, a blink in response to the puff of air, there's a blink in response to the tone. If there's um, escape in response to to uh, shock, there's escape in response to the light or tone or the odor. So most of the time, the behavior, the, uh, the conditioned response is very similar to the unconditioned response, but there are some exceptions. So they did a study that uh, were there, um, uh, this was done with rats um, and they injected adrenaline into rats and found that their heart rate would increase. And this was like an intense heart rate, rate increase. And then they would repeat the procedure in the same testing chamber. The testing chamber is, of course, a neutral stimulus. You know, we don't have any change in our heart rate, uh, or rats don't have any change in their heart rate to a particular space, a, a testing chamber. Um, but the, uh, the procedure 
was done in this testing chamber. And they will repeat it over and over and over in this neutral, initially neutral uh, context. And this testing chamber will come to be associated with a decrease in heart rate. So adrenaline would generally increase the heart rate. But if you put the rat into this same testing chamber over and over and again, right when you just put the rat in the testing chamber, it's before the adrenaline has come, it will lower its heart rate. The thought is that the rat is trying to maintain homeostasis. Uh, you've probably heard of homeostasis in regards to like temperature. Yeah, and, and it's the same idea that our body tries to keep ourselves from being too, you know, extreme. In, in this case, our, our body is trying to keep our heart rate from getting too extreme. And so our body is expecting adrenaline to come. And as a result, it decreases its heart rate so that when that adrenaline does come, it's not as extreme, right? Hopefully that makes sense. So generally what we call this is tolerance. Um, so it looks like the, the, rat, the rat has become tolerant. But generally when we think about tolerance, we think about it as a biological process, just something that happens inside of our body. And it does happen inside of our body. Um, but classical conditioning and the environment plays an important role in, in this drug tolerance process. Um, now, I said that this applies to a, a drug addiction. So um, let me break it down a little bit. The ingested drug is an unconditioned stimulus. You don't have to learn to have a reaction to heroin or to methamphetamine to react to it. You're, you're going to react to it. So the, the drug is the U.S., the euphoria and all the physiological effects are the unconditioned response. Okay, so let's go with heroin. Uh, there's the heroin is the stimulus, and what goes with heroin? Well, a uh, re, um, euphoric feeling, as well as a, a decrease in respiration. So, uh, heroin's an opioid; it slows down your breathing. And um, the drug using context, though wherever uh, the person might be using heroin is a conditioned stimulus. So this is again, the physical location where the drug is, is ingested. Like again, it might be through uh, intravenous use. Um, it's the time situation, emotional state of the person. Uh, even the, the appearance, texture and taste of the drug are, are part of the, the context. And, uh, also, that we know that um, part of this process, just like with the rats and adrenaline, is there is a compensatory homeostatic process. Um, the, the person's body begins to prepare for the drug once they're in this context where they would typically use. So um, in, this, in this context, the, uh, let's say if it's heroin, they're going to start increasing their heart rate. They're going to start increasing their level of alertness and arousal. And when the heroin comes, it all brings it back down. But, uh, but again, it's not as extreme as if um, they didn't prepare their body for it. Again, this is all unconscious. The person doesn't think about doing all these, making all these changes. It just happens as a result of um, the condition response. Now, of course, drug tolerance is, is partly the result of physiological adaptations to the drug, right? So our, our receptors in our brain adjust to the presence of the drug so that the drug has less of an effect. Um, but it's also enabled by our um, classically conditioned response to the drug using context. So we perceive ourselves in this context, and as a result, we connect that with a um, homeostatic effect. And what we know is if, if the drug is delivered in a novel context, the homeostatic processes won't engage. The effect of the drug can actually be greater. So let me say that again. If 
you are in a new situation you've never used in this situation before and uh, you were to use the drug, the homeostatic process wouldn't engage, you wouldn't uh, raise up your arousal, you wouldn't raise up your uh, attention and alertness, uh, you would just have the effect of the drug. And as a result, your, your body is not prepared for the drug. And what we know is that this actually increases the probability of overdose. The body is not prepared for the effects of the drug in a new situation. So we did this. Uh, the, so researchers did this with rats. Um, now, uh, for first-time dose rats, they gave them a large heroin dose, and that led to 96% fatal overdose. So the 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 thing to know is they're giving a very lethal dose, um, but but that's not the interesting part. Um, so they're basically just uh, uh, killing a lot of rats in that phase. The more interesting part is the, the next two, oh, moving over a little bit. So in rats with small heroin dose before the larger dose, notice that uh, in those boxes, it's exactly the same. The rats receive a small heroin dose and then they receive a larger dose. The only difference between the two is that for some of them, they received the larger dose in a different location. And for others, they receive it in the same location, the one that they received the first dose. Now look at those numbers. Those who received the dose in a different location, 64% fatally overdose. Now, that's not 96%. So the small heroin dose prepared them for the larger Dose. Their body has adjusted, compensated, so that their body is better prepared for the large dose. But look at that last call. Uh, physiologically, these rats are exactly the same. They've got a small dose and then a large dose. But um, environmentally, these rats in the same location knew that this is a location where drugs have been administered. So only 32% overdosed of those of that group. So the uh, the rats that that knew this is a location where I might receive heroin, um, they actually were better prepared, right? That's a lower number that overdosed, so that they were more likely to survive. The rats that were in the same location were more likely to survive than those who were, were in a different location. Now that again, what's the implication? Well. Down there at the bottom of this slide, you see uh, a variety of celebrities and, and musicians who died in uh, from overdoses in hotels. So you've got Whitney Houston, Janis Joplin, John Belushi, uh, Corey Monteith from Glee. Uh, each of them died in a hotel from an overdose. Now, um, for those who use heroin, they generally know their um, the, the dose that 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 they can um, tolerate. Uh, well, nowadays when um, heroin, heroin sometimes uh, tainted with fentanyl, which is far more powerful than heroin, um, and, and so the explanation for those overdoses could be very different. But assuming that they receive uh, uh, their typical dose, what could be happening? Well, what could be happening is they're in a hotel room. They are trying to use their normal dose because they think of it as just a physiological process, but their body looks around and their body isn't expecting the heroin to be coming, right? Um, and so uh, they may have overdosed because their body didn't kick in the homeostatic processes that could keep them alive. Uh, again, I think this is really interesting. Um, and it helps us understand craving. Um, so if we think about it a different way, we realize that uh, when someone is in an environment where they used before, their body is kicking in homeostatic processes. But what that actually does is it that their body is adapting even before the drug is coming and their body's preparing itself for the drug to come. 
So they, they expect the drug to come. So when you take someone who's a recovering addict, they stop using, and now they are in, let's say they, they get triggered, they, they get into a situation where they used to use their drug, their body is actually prepared for the drug to be coming. And the reason why they have such strong cravings to use, it's not, it's not just because they're thinking, oh, I should, it's not because they have bad uh, thinking per se. I mean, that could be a factor, but they, they might just have a physiological response, completely unconscious that their body is kicking into gear where they're, they're expecting the drug to be coming. So uh, this is really what makes recovering from addiction so difficult. Um, if they're in a situation where they think, um, again, without intentionally any, any deliberation on this, if they expect the drug to come, their body's going to have a really powerful reaction. So there's two strategies to, um, to overcome this. On the one hand, you could try to avoid the, the triggers. Try to avoid as many cues as possible. Keep yourself away from the conditioned stimuli, the, the CSs. The problem with that one, this works fairly well, right? You can avoid going to places where you used to use. You, if you're an alcoholic, you don't go to bars. If you're, um, if you're, uh, you know, a recovering drug user, you don't go visit your your dealer, your connect. Um, you try to avoid those cues as much as possible. And um, and yet, you also know we also know that you cannot avoid every trigger, and so that's where you need to have good coping. You need to seek help from non-drug using friends and family, um, because some of those CSs might strike you really powerfully. And so you need to be able to cope with them through support and through good, um, to be honest, like relaxation techniques and things like that can be really helpful. Now there's one last approach and it's, um, it's somewhat controversial, um, but it's basically, uh, so I, I pointed out that one approach would be to avoid, but avoidance doesn't extinguish the response. It just avoids it. Um, so again, potentially, if they get triggered, they're going to have a strong reaction. Another possibility is through exposure treatment. Uh, again, this this sounds uh, for a lot of people in recovery. This sounds really sketchy, um, but let me walk you through it and kind of argue for it. So, um, in some cases, you can actually put yourself in situations that were associated with drug use. And if you can be in those situations and not use, that can actually eliminate the reaction. So, um, so you can uh, expose the individual to various drug cues, including their, their home, their uh, different places where they used, and basically make sure that they don't use. If they do use, then it, it's not gonna work. But if you get, can get them to, to get triggered, and not use, that can gradually um, um, lessen their reaction to these cues and these triggers. Now, one really controversial idea was actually proposed by a uh, researcher, uh, Butin, who suggested that therapists could actually expose patients to small amounts of drug use. Okay, so well, getting them to actually use a little bit of drug. Well, Okay, this is a really uh, risky one. So small amounts of drugs are associated with the use of larger amounts of drugs. So what you could potentially do, let's say if it's cocaine, if you can get them to do a very short line of cocaine, not very much at all, just not even enough to get them high. Small enough to just, you know, get a little bit of the, the taste and experience. Um, what will happen? Well, if it's small enough, it won't produce an unconditioned response. Well, you'll have a, a uh, conditioned stimuli, the drug itself, and you won't have the unconditioned response from it. So the, the site of the drug is not a unconditioned stimulus. 
the drug ingestion is the unconditioned stimulus that can lead to euphoria. But the sight, even the taste of it, uh, is, is a neutral stimulus. So what you could do is you can uh, weaken the association between, you know, that little, that the cocaine that they saw and their craving response through a process of extinction. Again, uh, I, I worked with uh, heroin addicts in my previous work before I came to APU. Uh, I never tried this. I, I got to admit that. Um, it's an interesting idea. But I did encourage people, again, when they were, um, when the triggers were unavoidable, I taught them how to cope with the triggers. And I taught them, okay, it's, it's okay to get triggered. It's not a sign of, of, of weakness. It just is a sign that their body is reacting as a result of their addiction to those triggers. And so uh, help them understand it, help them cope with it. Um, and uh, for some people, it, it seemed like exposure, not avoidance, was the key to their recovery. So again, um, you want to be careful about recommending someone go to a bar who's a recovering alcoholic, but potentially it could be part of their recovery. Um, again, if they, uh, it's the key is if they are doing it as part of treatment, not as a part of a like personal uh, experiment, right? That's, that's not helpful. Okay. So, um, Hopefully that was kind of provocative. Just to wrap up with a couple last slides. Um, these behaviorists, uh, they were concerned mainly with discovering and explaining regularities uh, between stimuli and responses. Uh, are the theories good? Well, they do, they do very well in certain cert situations. They explain phobias really well. They explain uh, classical conditioning very well. Um, they explain, you know, skills that we're learning um, that's what Guthria offered. Um, so they, they tend to be fairly practical in applied settings. Um, theoretically, one of the weaknesses is they ignored individual differences in ability, right? Uh, so they tended to believe that it's only about nurture and there's no nature involved. And really, you want to avoid any kind of dichotomy of those. Right, we are both nature and nurture. But what about like a, a Christian evaluation? I think this is the um, this is important to, to think about because on the one hand, I want to uh, lift up the behaviorists, um, and yet I also want to acknowledge that they had some flaws. So let me start off and point out the behaviorists didn't subscribe to a spiritual realm; they weren't. Um, Christians in, in a, a real sense. So they didn't believe that faith in, in the spiritual realm applied to life. And I think actually this is probably why a lot of Christians rejected psychology in the early 20th century, because the leading psychologists were, were atheists were very secular. And so the Christians kind of assumed, oh, well, psychology has nothing to offer us. Um, and in particular, sort of philosophically, that, that sort of uh, would go against Christian belief is that the behaviorists would say that our behavior is a closed system, that it's just stimulus response, uh, basically saying we don't have free will. And as Christians, we, we generally believe that we do have free will. We're responsible for our actions, that we are making choices and we have to bear the, the responsibility for our choices. So um, again, that is uh, a place where there's some conflict with Christianity. Uh, another place was that they're arguing that behavior was individualistic rather than relational. Um, that Christianity talks about behavior as um, about a relationship with God, uh, about a community. And the behaviorists really thought about it as it's you and your environment. It's not about, you know, having connections to other people. Again, uh, behavior was not moral or immoral. It was just adaptive or uh, maladaptive. Having said all that, I think the behaviorists make some good points. 
that Christians should pay attention to. I think behaviors emphasize the importance of behavior over vague notions of knowledge. So sometimes as Christians, we think, oh, I need to study the Bible so that I can understand better. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. So when I, I think about that verse, I think, you know, uh, it's good to have knowledge, but knowledge has a, a risk that if we have a lot of knowledge, it can build up our pride. But love is the foundation for building um, uh, goodness, uh, for really contributing to God's kingdom. So it is our actions, our actions of love that are more important than what we know. So I, I think that's important. And I don't have it up here, but I think the behaviors also have it right in appreciating that as creatures, you know, as God's creation, while we do have responsibility for our actions, I think there's certainly some cir circumstances where we are just responding to our environment. And so I think sometimes Christians assume with addiction, with mental illness, that the person is choosing their sickness. But what we learn from the behaviorists is that sometimes the, the behavior is not a, um, entirely a choice, but it is a habit. It's something that's built up from experience. And so I think the behaviors kind of, if we, um, we don't have to fully embrace it, but we can uh, ha have a balance that says, yeah, some of the ways that we act are the result of our past experiences and our past um, you know, uh, exposures to certain circumstances. And so I think that is a helpful idea. So again, I, I don't want to write off the behaviors in any, in any fashion. I want to critically engage it, but I also want to learn from it. Okay, so um, that's it for this section. Uh, a little humor, right? A uh, uh, little known failure, Pavlov's cat. Uh, so if you, if you own a cat, maybe you can identify with this, our, our cat, Halo. Uh, he, uh, he's not easily trained. Uh, we have a dog and a cat. We've been able to, to train our dog uh, to sit and do some basic tricks, but uh, not gonna happen with our cat. So. Um, yeah, and uh, last little bit of humor. Honey, I invited Pavlov over to dinner tonight. Oh, good, it will be nice too. Ding dong. And with that, I wrap up. Okay, take care.